correct and and do all that since I my my attention should be on the road here. I completely understand. Um, so, do we have a motion to approve the minutes from this last meeting, which was January sixth? I'll make that motion. Okay. Nelson second. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as presented, indicate by saying aye. 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 Same sign for no. Minutes accepted. All right. Okay. Uh, next item, Christina. Your next item is board vacancies and applications. Um, we have three current vacancies, um, and they consist of right now we we don't have an official paperwork yet from um, Dr. Ruckman, but he did notify me of his resignation. We also have a layperson, and now with the city code change, a mental health practitioner position to fill. I know Meg shared on, as was the request this last month, Meg shared on social media that we were looking for a mental health practitioner to join us and that we also had other openings available, but we'll need a dentist, a mental health practitioner, and a layperson to fill those spots. Um, I forwarded over three applications from individuals. I don't know if you guys had a chance to look them over. If any of you wanted to recommend one of those to go forward. I did have a question about one of them. Yes. Uh, Dr. Volmecki uh, is also running for school board. I didn't know if that would cause a problem for him or if he was aware of that at the time that he submitted his uh, application that he was going to run for school board. That's going to be a lot on your plate if he gets elected. Um, my understanding, and I can double check with our city clerk, is that it would not be a conflict for us because it is not a city position. You can't, according to city charter, hold more than one position within the city at one time, but because it would be on the outside, he would be fine to, to serve here and serve there should he choose. And Christina, I'm not aware of any state statute that would prohibit somebody from serving in, in those capacities as well for okay. as a school board member. I'm not aware of any, doesn't mean that we maybe shouldn't explore it, but I'm not aware of any statutes that would prohibit somebody. Are we interested in sending, so there was Dennis Hart, Zachary Mallory, and Jason Volmecki. I don't know if you guys want to discuss it again um, at the next meeting or not, or if you guys want to make a recommendation to send to the council to consider one of them for possibly a layperson or. So just to be so clear, we, we don't have a dentist, any dentist, anybody to fill the dentist spot or the mental health. Is that correct? Um, my reading of their applications is that they are not dentists and they don't um, meet the definition of mental health practitioner. Um, one of them is a chiropractic physician um, and a certified medical examiner. And yeah. And the other one has a BA in health and is a doctor of chiropractic medicine. Um, but ne neither one of them is, you know, I guess none of the three are mental health practitioners. None of the three list dentists. Um, so each of the three would need to be considered as a for the layperson position. Does anybody on the board have any know any of these people they could speak to it to them i do not i do not would a few members of the board be willing to reach out and form a small subcommittee to 
talk with these three and decide which one you would like to make a recommendation to for the larger board? I'm happy to do that if somebody wants to join me in it. It can't, you know, I, I, I think the, uh, the urgency is there. We got to, we got to fill these positions. So we're not always scrambling to make form every month, every time we want to meet. I'd be willing to serve with John. Okay. Thank so you. Dr. Ruddy and Dr. Morris. Okay. Great. If you guys need me to arrange something, let me know if you guys want to just use the applications and reach out to them. That is whatever makes you guys happy and works for you. Okay. Well, I'll reach out to Dr. Morris and we can talk about it and make arrangements that fit our schedule and, and get this done in the near future so we can make a recommendation to the larger board. Okay. Uh, the other thing to consider, and we don't have to consider it immediately since the resignation is not um, official yet, but we will need to consider um, who would like to chair the board going forward. Uh, the requirement by city code is that the individual has to be a resident of independence, um, but and a member of the board, of course. So I don't know if anyone is horribly interested in the position, <laughs> would like to throw their hat in the ring, or would just like to think about it. And or if we nominate people who don't show up to the meetings. Also, I'm all for that. I'm Jason here. I, I'm a firm believer in a line of succession, so I'm comfortable <laughs> with that. Uh, I, back to the members. How do we how do we find some dentists and mental health folks to apply before our next meeting? Because I agree with Dr. Ruddy. I, it'd be nice to have that diversity as well as the assurity, you know, we'll have quorums and we can continue to engage i i can ask meg to do another post on social media um i mean we didn't get a single application out of the last one uh, i know that there are other vacancies uh, in other boards and committees commissions that the city has um, that they're also struggling to fill i know in the past what has worked is you know Dr. Ruckman would occasionally, if we needed a vet, go around and, you know, talk to all the vets until it finally happened. Someone caved. I do know a couple dentists locally. Um, and with the changes in our uh, requirements uh, that they practice in the community, they don't have to live here any longer and they don't necessarily mm -hmm. have their own practice. Uh, I'm happy to reach out to some and see if they'd be willing to donate a little bit of time. I did reach out indirectly through my wife today to uh, a local dentist who used to serve on the uh, uh, city council uh, to inquire if he'd be happy to be on the, the board. And uh, my, my wife said he laughed quite heartily and apparently was not particularly interested <laughs> in uh, being on the advisory board. But I know a couple other people uh, and he, ha he actually had some suggestions for uh, folks that we might want to consider. So I, I can certainly reach out to some people. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is a discussion on the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, I don't know if Dr. Morris or Dr. Nelson want to jump in. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it a little bit. Um, okay. See if I can share my screen here. Um, it hasn't gone away. Um, this is the slide that does luckily show a decline uh, in new cases. I think the important thing about this is to realize we're still regionally having 2,100 new cases a day which is more cases than we had recorded in any of the previous uh, spikes in the pandemic. Uh, this is hospitalizations for Eastern Jackson County and we're down to about 20 per day. That's still 140 people a week that are winding up in the hospital. Uh, and during the worst peak that we had uh, back in 
September, I think it was, no, August 16th, we were at 24 a day. So we're just really barely below that. So everyone's celebrating the fact that it's getting better, but it's not gone and the hospitals are still hurting. Um, this is the death rate, um, which is uh, still down, which is good. Uh, I, I think an important fact is that we did pass 900,000 deaths uh, nationally uh, earlier in the month, uh, which is really, 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 really depressing. Uh, the Center for Disease Control, uh, Rochelle Walensky, uh, pointed out this week that something interesting that fully vaccinated Americans are 14 times less likely to die of COVID than people who haven't gotten shots. Boosted Americans are 97 times less likely to die. So uh, it continues to be a matter of getting vaccinated and getting boosted. Uh, this is Missouri data. Uh, currently, we're looking at 63% uh, of people in Missouri have at least initiated vaccination, but as far as being completely vaccinated, only 55% is, which is a little bit below the national average. We always have to remember that means 45% of people in Missouri uh, uh, have not been fully vaccinated. Uh, and only 43% have had received their booster dose. Uh, if you look at the age group data, it's pretty much the same as, as we've had before. Uh, we haven't budged much in the over 65. Uh, we still have at least 10% of those over 65 that have not been vaccinated at all. Um, and uh, when you get into the younger age groups, uh, 5 through 17, uh, at least half the, half the uh, children in those groups haven't been vaccinated. Uh, this is kind of an interesting graphic that looks at the total doses administered over time. You can see our immunization rate is falling. On this chart, it has little purple bars with little gold bars on top. And the purple bars are people that received first or second doses. And the gold bar are people that received their booster doses. So much of the vaccination that went on in early January, mid-January, were booster doses that were going on. So the crystal ball, of course, asks us what's around the corner. Uh, there's lots of little critters out there for us to think about. Uh, probably the variant that's got the most interest at the moment is uh, Omicron that we're looking at, BA1, uh, cousin BA.2. Uh, it's present, it's the majority of the virus that they're seeing in Scandinavia. Uh, it's now in the United States and present in 30 of the 50 states, including Missouri. Uh, it's probably a little bit more infectious than Omicron, but does seem to respond to the vaccine. Uh, hopefully, we're moving from a pandemic to an endemic disease, which is means it's still going to be around. We're going to deal with it like we do the flu. Uh, there was an interesting uh, research letter in JAMA last week that they had a study. It was a very small study, and it's just kind of an interest that of uh, people that had confirmed COVID, they did antibody tests, and 99% of them had antibodies of uh, people that thought they probably had COVID but had not been tested. 55% had antibodies. And of those people who had no history of COVID, only 11% had antibodies. So we've still got 30 or 40% of the population in Missouri that uh, hasn't been immunized and doesn't think they've had COVID. And most of them are probably not going to have antibodies. Uh, this is also uh, Missouri data, which is interesting because it looks at the positive cases since January 1st. And at the end of this graph uh, are some very big bars. And uh, or actually, this is from January of, of 21. But since the end of last year and the beginning of this year, there's been a the big spike. But 40% of the cases that are being reported are in people that are immunized. 
So we're still seeing a lot of people and with the disease and a lot of those have been immunized. But as uh, an immunologist put in, a, put in his podcast last week, he said, in essence, your immune system is allocating resources and its primary goal is to keep you alive. So our immune system may have decided that with coronavirus, it's not worth stopping the infection as long as it can stop serious life threatening illness. And, and that really is our goal. Uh, hospitals are still swamped. Uh, ERs are still swamped. ICUs are still swamped. Uh, it's better than it was, but we've got to learn to battle the fatigue and uh, keep people out of the hospital if we can. Uh, and that's our goal. Christina, anything else? Or Dr. Nelson have anything to add from his? Yeah, research? happy. Yeah, ha happy to give a quick update if, if that's all right. Always appreciate um, Terry's observations, um, and I, I think um, the irony for for my observations is just as he was alluding to, it's it's awkward for me to report how much better the status of COVID is in our hospital than it was at its worst a month or six weeks ago. But the data, as he alluded to, still suggests that this thing is far from over. But there's no question that its, it's presence in our communities and the impact it's having is, is transitioning, um, I think. And, and Terry, I, I don't know how much of the genomic data has been available. We haven't had any real line of sight directly other than just the, the wastewater data, which updates periodically. But we're convinced clinically that it has transitioned um, significantly from Delta to Omicron. We think the transition came later than it seems like a lot of the news outlets and even some of the evidence-based data was suggesting because we were still having just really high incidences of, <clears throat> you know, the dramatic respiratory failure, ventilatory support scenarios that we had come to see through um, the, the winter months, and we're still pretty convinced that it was either really, really bad Omicron or it was still a pretty active uh, presence of Delta. And, and it started a pretty precipitous drop uh, on the inpatient side, uh, as well as on our staff uh, absenteeism side about two and a half weeks ago now. And it was interesting as we were um, on the citywide calls, and I know you keep track of the updates that Dr. Stites gives and KU's done an awesome job, I think, trying to help with the messaging across the community. But we were starting to see it ease before really kind of the, the Johnson County side and, and even some of the metro, the more central metro Kansas City. And, and on, the, on the reverse end, we saw it kind of really spin up, as you all probably recall, and North Kansas City Liberty and us were really seeing the early um, kind of impact of it. So. So we do think that it's transitioned more significantly to Omicron. Um, it's awkward to say that it's times are better when we've got about 25 active patients now, but that's down from almost 80 at our peak um, a few weeks ago. So it's been a dramatic drop in relative terms as far as hospitalization. Uh, to your point, we've still got a subset who are really, really sick. I think there's 11 on the bed in our 25-bed ICU this morning, and I think eight of those 11 were um, COVID acute or a legacy COVID patient. So it's by no means done and gone, but it is transitioning itself. And I think to be honest with you, the story for us as a board of health and for our community is that we're not feeling any relief of the impact of our hospital synthesis um, because of this dramatic shift in our staffing challenges. And those are not easing um, by any means. That's in part folks obviously exiting the industry uh, concurrently with a lot of areas that are still even more acutely being hit and are using contracts to hire nurses and other clinicians out of our area. So we're still faced with a, a critical staffing shortage heavily in the critical care nursing ranks, um, but just generally across the institution. So um, I think we're a little disappointed that um, as the numbers come down, our daily operational challenges don't feel as much better to us as they should, although we're delighted not as many people are acutely ill with COVID or as many staff are out. 
um, but we're still faced with a lot of things that are concerning to us about caring for um, our community. So I think we're trying to figure out what the post COVID, post high acuity COVID world is going to look like in healthcare going forward. And I think most of us who are still in the midst of it think it's going to look very different and time will tell. So, but, uh, but we're certainly grateful to see the pacing um, ease with the high acuity patients. So. Dr. Nelson, this is, this is Terry Morris. Uh, some of the yeah. data that I was looking at said that, that numbers have fallen significantly in the metro areas, but seems to be falling much slower in rural Missouri. Have you seen an increase in transfers? I know you have more availability for transfers than you have. But. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the really sad commentary on this, Terry, and it's so hard for us in these larger metropolitan hospitals because we have had unprecedented, not just hours, but days on transfer closure, largely because of the staffing. We are starting to get open back up, um, and we are still seeing significant demand from the rural communities. And, and the denial data is in the astronomical numbers, and you probably heard sites and the crew talk about the, the unbelievable numbers of denials KU um, has had to not be able to accept. And, and we've seen in relative terms that similar. As you know, our service area here in Independence is kind of a V going out to the east. Um, and, and we've not been able to service Lexington and Marshall and Warrensburg and Ray County um, uh, like we had uh, in the past. But as we started to open up, we still have demand for transfer uh, from those communities. So my, my informal sense is, is that they're still significantly burdened um, and that it's, it's not eased there as much yet. Thank you. Yep. Christina. Dr. Ruddy, that is the last thing on the agenda. If there's any other business, um, people should speak up now. Otherwise, I, you have covered everything on your agenda for the evening. Great. Thanks for everyone's attendance tonight and appreciate the updates. And uh, we'll get to work on finding a replacement for these open seats. And um, I'll accept a motion to uh, adjourn the meeting. So move. Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Hey, take care. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Thank you.